Good morning. So I've been thinking a lot about the future of JavaScript. I mean, it's the language we're all stuck with, and we all have a big investment, professional investment, emotional investment in this language and what happens to it. I'm on TC39, which is the committee, which is the steward of the standard for the language. And we're constantly getting bombarded with feature requests. Um, most of the requests come from people who don't use the language or who are using it under duress. You know, you know, I'm writing in JavaScript. I'd rather be writing in Java, so could you make it more like Java and less like JavaScript? We get a lot of that stuff, or Python, or pick any other language. We, that's most of what we get. But it, we get some more uh, important uh, ideas as well. And many of the things that we're considering are things which happened in the past, which have been neglected or forgotten, or things which happened in the past that uh, were never in the language. Maybe they should be. And it raises a question, if we're going back and doing this stuff again, were we wrong the first time when we moved away from it? Or are we wrong now in going back to something which we've already moved away from? Um, and in order to answer those sorts of questions, you need some historical context, because otherwise you just end up going in circles and, and not making progress. So I'm going to give you the punchline to this talk now. I think it's important enough. I don't want to wait till the end. And that is that progress does not wait for the next new idea. It waits for consensus on the old idea. And this consensus can sometimes take decades or more to occur. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. We have this romantic idea about progress where um, someone discovers something and everybody goes, we've been waiting for this. And then suddenly it's adopted and, and it changes the world. That never happens. That's not how the important stuff happens. So we're going to start with this guy. Uh, who knows who this is? Nobody? Uh, this is Edgar uh, Dijkstra. Um, he was uh, the first Dutch computer scientist. In 1972, the ACM gave him the AM Turing Award, which is their most prestigious award. When you get the Turing Award, you give a Turing lecture. And this is um, Dijkstra in San Francisco at the Palace Hotel, a couple of blocks from here, giving a talk called The Humble Programmer. Brilliant talk, full of controversial stuff, but it holds up really well. He was right about an amazing amount of stuff, stuff which was highly controversial at the time. They gave him the award because he'd done a lot of stuff over his career. He had done work in programming languages. So he was on the Algol 60 committee. He did work on concurrency. Um, uh, semaphores and a lot of our understanding of mutual exclusion. The reason that threads work is because of things that Dijkstra did. He worked on operating systems. Uh, he worked on uh, a lot of stuff, good stuff. But the thing he is best remembered for is having written a letter. It was a really important letter, had a huge impact on the industry. Um, and I want to, to share that letter with you. It, um, it was published by the ACM, or in the communications of the ACM. And the title was, not his title, but the editor out of this title, Go To Statement Considered Harmful. I want to read you the first two sentences. For, and I'm not going to read it with his funny accent. I'll just read it with my funny accent. For a number of years, I've been familiar with the observation that the quality of programmers is a decreasing function of the density of go to statements in the programs they produce. Now, there had been an observation that the more, more go-tos you had in a program, the crappier the program was. So the harder it was going to be to understand and maintain, the more likely it was going to be debuggy. That wasn't really um, disputed. But Dijkstra said it in maybe the most offensive way possible, right? He's not saying that the programs with go-to are bad. The programmers who use go-to are bad, right? We should you know, love the coder but hate the code, right? And, he said this in the most offensive way. Um, Alan Kay once said of Dijkstra that um, arrogance is measured in nano Dijkstras. <laughs> uh, so bad start, but, but let's continue. More recently, I discovered why the use of the go-to statement has such disastrous effects. He's being way dramatic here. Right? This is kind of over the top, flaming, way too dramatic. Um, going from the thing which is observable, that programs with fewer go-tos are better, 
is way different than saying disastrous, right? So he jumps to this inflammatory conclusion without any evidence. Uh, but then he finishes that sentence. I became convinced that the go-to statement should be abolished from all higher level programming languages. This was explosive. This started a debate which went on for decades and it was a passionate debate, a deeply emotional, uh, angry debate, which consumed our industry for a long time. Um, so let, let's uh, deconstruct the, the argument. So the radicals were saying that the go-to statement was a disaster, should be eliminated. And uh, there is some good evidence to support that. Um, you know, if the fewer go-to statements you have, the better the program seems to be. Let's just drive the number of go-to statements to zero and make things the best they are, and that way we'll avoid disaster. Um, it, uh, else and while were just appearing in programming languages around that time, and it was observed that if you have else and while, that eliminates most of the need for go-tos. Then you had the reactionaries who said, but it doesn't eliminate all the needs for go-to, and we need some of those uses. Um, there's a performance argument here that there are cases where if you don't have go-to, you need an extra variable and an if, and we just can't afford that. We, we, for performance, we need to hold on to the go-to. There is an also an argument about tradition. We have always had go-to, and so we should always have go-to. There was um, an argument about freedom, that we have go-to in our languages, I should have a right to use it. <laughs> right? It is how I express myself. I express myself with go-tos, and if you take the go-tos out of the language, I can't be an artist in the way that I write my code. It doesn't matter that my code is crap, I should have that right. Um, and, and then there's the pride argument, that you're saying I'm not smart enough to know when it's okay to use go-tos and when I'm not. That's an insult, and I am angry, and for that reason we should continue to use go-tos. And then finally there was the majority argument, which started off with nobody wants to eliminate go-tos, which is obviously wrong because the reason the question comes up is because somebody does. So mathematically that argument makes no sense. The smarter guy has followed and said, the majority of us want go-tos. We don't want it eliminated. And they continued to say that without any evidence that, in fact, they represented the majority. And they continued making that argument long after they didn't. And in all of those arguments, they completely lost sight of what the debate should have been. We're trying to figure out the best way to write programs. How someone else writes programs is irrelevant. I'm trying to figure out you know, for each person, what's the best way? And if it turns out the rest of the industry is wrong, that doesn't mean that you should do it wrong. Um, so all of these arguments were ridiculous. Then there were the uh, moderates, the peacemakers, who were saying, no, 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 um, who recognized that the radicals were right about structured programming, and we should try to avoid the go-tos, but said the reactionaries are right too, and that sometimes the go-to is appropriate. Um, so we should avoid it where we can, but sometimes it is useful. I defy anybody to name any substance which is not sometimes useful, uh, which could be dangerous, could be toxic, could be disgusting, it could be horrible, but still sometimes useful. So if your criteria for having something is that it's sometimes useful, that's insanity, right? Um, it, it's meaningless, something useful as a criteria of valuing something is useless, unless you're a hoarder. If you're a hoarder, then it makes a lot of sense. You want to keep everything you ever encountered because it might be useful. But for the rest of us, it, it doesn't make sense. So this was the argument, and it went on for a long time. And eventually, um, we figured out that Dijkstra was right. He was wrong about the disaster. Um, go -to, getting rid of go-to was a modest improvement but disasters still happen. It's still possible to write really bad programs even without a go-to. Um, so this was maybe the first instance of someone recognizing a bad part in a language and saying, well, let's just not use that. And that you know, we start being more selective, that um, we're not paid to use every feature of the language. 
we're paid to use the language well. And it turns out some features of any language are going to be problematic and, and get us into trouble. We can simply avoid the trap. But it took a long time to figure that out. So let's look at the chronology. So Dijkstra publishes his letter in 1968. Now, he doesn't claim originality for the idea that GoTo should be eliminated. Someone suggested the idea to him in 1959. And at that time, he completely missed it, didn't understand what the guy was talking about, didn't make any sense. Nine years later, he understood the wisdom of the statement and said, OK, and he became a major advocate for it. Um, just after Dijkstra publishes his letter, Dennis Ritchie begins work on the C. And it turns out Ritchie is a moderate. C um, supports structured programming. Uh, he discourages use of GoTo, but GoTo is in the language. Uh, um, 1985, C++ comes out, still has a GoTo. 1995, 10 years later, Java comes out. Java does not have a GoTo statement in it, and the world does not end. So the predictions that the um, reactionaries were, were making didn't come true. So we've got a language without GoTo. Java is not the first go-to free language, but it's maybe the most important. Um, it, it marks a, uh, an important mark in history that from that point on, the languages without go-to are the exceptions. Java establishes a new rule. But Java itself doesn't have complete confidence that it got it right either, because it makes go-to a reserved word in the language just in case they got it wrong. So they released Java 1.0. Hey, it didn't blow up. No disaster. It was great. It's still a reserved word. We're up to Java, what, 7 now? Um, and it's still a reserved word. There, you know, just in case um, someone finds a problem with it. Um, so why did it take so long? This is an example of a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift is when there's something that fundamentally changes. And unless you've experienced that change, you cannot understand the arguments for why that change may be good or bad. And we have that happen all the time in hu human experience. A lot of m the misery that we suffer in society is a result of the difficulty of making these shifts. And it happens even in programming languages. Um, you know, we imagine ourselves to be the most rational people in the world because we're the ambassadors to the computer. So we would not have emotional arguments about things like the features in a programming language, but it turns out that's not true. And so getting over the paradigm shift is a really difficult thing for us. So if you ever hear someone making an argument about a, a feature, like, I have never used that feature, therefore I don't see the reason for why we should do it, that's an example of someone who doesn't understand a paradigm shift. And there's no way you can argue with that person because they think they understand your argument and they fundamentally reject it because they do not understand it. And that's why it takes us so long to do something which should be as trivial as removing an un unnecessary statement from a programming language. So let me tell you a story about a bug. Because ultimately, our number one concern in making our programs is trying to make them bug free. If, we're not, if that's not a principal concern, then we're doing it wrong. So let me tell you about a bug that I made. It's confession time. So in 2001, I wrote in Java a package for JSON, which was a brand new data interchange format. And this package could create JSON text and parse JSON text. And in the parser, I had this variable called index, which was counting the characters in the text that it was parsing, so that if it got an error, it could say, I found a syntax error at this character. And I made it an int, because that's how you make them. 11 years later, someone creates a JSON text which is many gigabytes in size, which is something I never anticipated. When I first wrote the package, a gigabyte was a good-sized hard drive. I couldn't imagine someone would dedicate an entire hard drive to one JSON text. It didn't make sense to me. <laughs> so an int was fine for, for indexing that. But last year, I got a bug report from someone who said they had something that was many gigabytes in size. Because JSON was expected to do things in Ks, right? I just never imagined that someone would make something that absurdly huge. 
but he did, and he had a syntax error which happened after the two millionth character. <laughs> and so the bug report, or the, the, the syntax error that, that uh, the, the JSON package produced, said he had an error at character minus some ridiculous number, which couldn't possibly be true. My error was I picked the wrong data type. I should have made it a long, but I made it an int because I couldn't imagine that that value would ever overflow. I didn't even think about it. So Java, by offering me a choice of data types, allowed me to choose the wrong one. So um, the, the reason it overflowed and did the crazy thing is because of the way that ints work. When you have a number that you're trying to put into an int which is bigger than what an int can hold, it will overflow and wrap around. So instead of being the largest number that it can hold, it is suddenly the smallest number that it can hold, which is a, the largest imaginable error that you could make. Ints do that. And the reason they do that is because in the 40s and 50s, when the first CPUs were being designed, the, the hardware designers realized that um, they don't have to implement a, so, a subtraction operation if they use complement, a, a complementary representation for the numbers. So you just take all the bits and, and exclusive orum, and uh, maybe you do an end around carry in order to, to deal with that, and that's all you have to do. Um, so we can save those gates. And in those days, gates were really expensive. And so having to not implement those saved a lot of cost. We're still using that representation even though it causes the worst possible behavior. In some applications where you've got specialized hardware, people do things smarter, like in DSPs and in some graphics processors, there's a thing called add with saturate. So if an add overflows, instead of flipping the zero or past zero to a huge negative number, it just maxes out at some maximum value. Or another reasonable thing would be to come up with some form of NAN which says, you're in the weeds, man. Your numbers don't mean anything, but you know, there you go. That would be a reasonable thing to do, too. That's not what ints do. Um, but Fortran had them, and then CPUs kept them working that way for compatibility, and we're, then C did it, and now we're stuck with them. So we've got these awful number types. Then to compound that problem, they now come in a variety of sizes. Um, and it used to be important to have those sizes that um, an, we used to have CPUs in which an adding 8-bit numbers was eight times faster than adding 64-bit numbers. And also the amount of memory that was there was very constrained, like the Atari 2600. Anyone remember the VCS? That machine had 128 bytes, bytes of RAM in it. So the heroes who programmed that machine had to be really careful about how they use those bytes. And those bytes included um, all of the state of the program and the stack and everything, 128 bytes. So in that context, yeah, having little ints made a lot of sense. But for the things we do t today, they don't, because we now have gigabyte RAMs in all of our devices, even the little bitty ones. And so trying to save some bits in a variable is absolutely a waste of time. It, it, it adds this reliability problem. You know, someday it, it, it's more likely to, to flip over and go bad. But in the meantime, we're just wasting time trying to figure out how big should this variable be. So um, in Java, you've got byte, short, int, long, float, and double. You've got six fundamental number types and then a lot more in the library. Having so many types means that you have an increased opportunity of picking the wrong one, and that you're going to insert errors into your program simply because you had this wide array of, of types to choose from. JavaScript only has one number type, and it turns out that's the right answer. Um, JavaScript is not trying to do this ridiculous optimization of the size of variables. It just says, you got a number and everything is that number. And so the, the errors that are created by picking the wrong number simply cannot occur. 
That's a good thing. The problem with JavaScript is that the one number type it has is the wrong one. <laughs> and it's not even uh, JavaScript's fault, because every language designed in the last 20 years made the same mistake, has the same wrong number type in it. Um, if I had to blame anybody, I'd blame Intel, because it, it came out of uh, their floating point processor. And the problem is um, binary floating point. A binary floating point made a lot of sense in the 50s. Not so much now. So the fundamental problem with binary floating point is that it cannot accurately represent decimal fractions. And that's only a problem if you live on a planet that uses a decimal system, like ours. <laughs> Especially in that all of our money systems use decimal. And so when you add up people's money, they expect to get the right answer. And it doesn't. And that is a problem. So um, um, in, in the 50s, there were two branches of computing. There was scientific, uh, Fortran being the best example, and there was business-oriented. COBOL was the best example of that. Um, uh, Fortran had binary floating point, and COBOL had BCD, or binary coded decimal, where they would take the digits and encode them in four bits and add them. And, it turns out um, binary arithmetic is much faster and easier to do than that. And so eventually, um, the scientific model won. But um, Java, almost by default, became the successor of COBOL. It is now the common business language. But it doesn't understand these decimal types. And so it's got this hazard in it because it's got the wrong types. Uh, we recognize this problem in JavaScript. And IBM proposed a new uh, decimal floating point format for the language. But it was a ridiculous format. It was incredibly complicated, very, very slow to implement. A software implementation was hundreds of times slower than um, hardware for, for floating point. Um, so the, the com committee unfortunately rejected it. Um, so this is what um, IBM should have proposed. So I call this DEC64. It fits in a 64-bit word. Um, it contains two pieces of information, a coefficient and an 8-bit exponent. Um, the thing that's uh, most different about this from binary floating point is we've got a factor of 10 there, not a factor of 2. And because we have that factor of 10, it does the right thing, that it matches all of our intuitions that we learned in elementary school and, and middle school about how numbers work. These numbers work the same way. Um, and it's fast to implement. So the fast path for an ad um, simulated in software, five instructions. Um, a load, an or, uh, a jump that you don't take, an ad, and another jump you don't take, and you're done. Pretty fast. It's much faster than trying to emulate floating point in, in software. In hardware, we can now do um, most ads in one cycle with all the benefits of floating point. You know, for the complicated cases, it'll take a little longer. But for most, most of the cases, one cycle. Anybody from Intel here? You need to be implementing this. We need this. Um, so in JavaScript, we have another problem with numbers. And that is we have this stupid plus operator. And the reason it's stupid is because it adds and concatenates. But it's in a loosely typed language. So you don't know which one it's going to do until it actually goes to implement it. Uh, this has the problem of sometimes concatenating when you intend to add, and that is always a really bad thing. Um, so um, for ES4, which was something we considered a long time ago, I proposed that we add a concatenate operator to the language so we could start to tease these two functions apart. And we would recommend that people use the concatenate operator exclusively for doing string concatenation and then tell the IDEs and the linters to warn people when they're doing the other thing. And then at some point in the future, we can say, we're now going to fix plus. So plus will only add, and those errors will go away. Um, I couldn't convince TC39 to do this because they couldn't see a, a way going forward into the future in which um, people would fix their programs and we and so they didn't think this would actually have any benefit. 
since then, a couple of things have happened. One is the discovery of WAT. You all know WAT? Um, that's where you take something that JavaScript does, like the plus operator, which is inexcusably stupid, and you put it up on a slide and you go, WAT? <laughs> it turns out to be really popular. You see a lot of people doing that today. So there's now this, it's, it's even worse than that it causes bugs in your programs. It's causing embarrassment to um, the JavaScript community. So that, that's something to pay attention to. The other is now that we're trying to make JavaScript go really fast. So the fastest you could theoretically make JavaScript go is if you could take the plus operator and emit for the plus operator a single instruction which tells the CPU to add. And you can't do it because there's no way you can represent that table in one instruction. Um, if all it did was add, then maybe you could. So um, that's an, another reason for why we might do that. So if we ever finish ES6, I'm going to propose for ES7, let's try it again. Um, let's, maybe we can finally fix this thing. Um, so one of the things that Dijkstra talks about in his um, acceptance speech for the Turing Award is proofs of correctness. They observe that tests can only prove the existence of bugs, not their absence. So test-driven development was rejected in, in the 60s for, for not being good enough, that what we needed was some way, something that actually would work, where we could prove that the program is going to work. And the people driving this work were mathematicians. And there I, you know, in working with mathematics, you'll create um, an equation, and then you'll write a proof, which is the proof that the equation is correct. And often the proof is much, much larger and more interesting than the equation itself. And there was thinking that we should do programs the same way. So you write a program, and then you write a proof about the program that tells us that the program is going to work. Dijkstra in his talk thinks, that's not going to work. We, we need to do the proof at the same time that we're writing the program. So he, he wants to integrate the proof language into the programming language. So you're writing a loop, and as you're writing the loop, you're also writing the proof that the loop is going to terminate. Now what you really want is proof that the loop is going to produce the correct result. But that's way too hard, okay? So he's thinking, let's do the simpler problem, let's just figure out that it terminates. But that's the halting problem, okay? Which we already know in, in complicated cases is impossible, but that, that's sort of what they're hoping for. So proofs of correctness didn't work, unfortunately, and so we're still testing, which is the best we've been able to figure out how to do. Um, Donald Knuth had this joke comment in one of his programs, beware of bugs in the above code. I've only proved it correct, not tried it. Um, that, that was the fundamental problem with the proofs, that um, programs are so complicated, and the specification of the program itself could be wrong. And so testing against specifications doesn't really prove anything. Um, so then the idea about types came up. You know, we have types in our languages anyway. Um, can we make use of that? You know, in, in assembly language, um, you can access a word, and that word could contain a number or a floating point number or a lot of little numbers or it could contain an instruction or it could contain some characters. Uh, there's nothing in the word itself to tell you which of those things you're going to get. Um, but in Fortran, um, it mattered. So um, Fortran would say this variable, which represents a, a word in memory, is only going to contain integers. And that word is only going to contain reals. And that way, uh, we can tell what's going on. So an idea came up, well, since we've got this type information in the programs anyway, can we use that to give us at least some of the benefit that we hope to get from the proofs of correctness? One of the big advocates of this was Robin Milner, um, who said this ridiculous thing. He said, well-typed programs cannot go wrong. Way overstating the benefits that typing could have. He was a brilliant guy. He came up with the ML language, brilliant language, um, but he was, he made a promise here that he couldn't keep. Type systems are not that good, are still not that good. And most of the type systems that we use today, he would consider to be inadequate. He was talking specifically about the uh, 
type inference engine that he put into ML. The thing we have in Java is total crap from his point of view, um, but that's sort of the state of the art. So, and, and we have an argument about that now. Um, and these arguments always start with the radicals. Um, in this case, the radicals are you guys. Um, the radicals are people using languages with dynamic typing and finding out they work, despite all the predictions from the static typing community that they cannot possibly work. You cannot possibly write good programs, large programs, valuable programs without static typing, and you guys do it every day. And they don't understand how that can happen. And so the argument against them is not that it's not a good idea, it's just that it's not worth the freight. That there's all this additional work you have to do in using a type system, and it provides some benefit, but not enough benefit to justify that cost, and so you don't need to do it. You're better off without it. The reactionaries cannot understand that. Um, they think that the uh, maintenance of type information is very little effort, that it's work that you're going to do anyway, that it's unavoidable, so as long as you're doing it, get the benefit from it. They don't understand that you don't have to do it, and you cannot tell them that argument. They will not understand it. They think it's there to help you, and they think there's something wrong with you for refusing that help. Then you've got the moderates, as always, who are in the middle saying, it should be optional, it's a matter of taste. Anytime you get someone talking about technology as saying it's a matter of taste, they're wrong. It's, it's <laughs> not about taste, it's about technology. And, and they're right answers to this stuff, actually. It's, it's not a choice, it, it's real. Um, so this argument also gets caught up in the classical versus prototypal argument. It doesn't need to. Uh, these ideas of, of static typing and, and classes are orthogonal, but they tend to get bound together really tightly, sort of like um, anti-abortion and pro-guns. There's no reason why anyone should have to hold both of those beliefs, but generally people do. Um, so we see the same thing. And so there's a lot of interest now in adding classes to JavaScript, even though one of JavaScript's best features is that it doesn't have class there are a lot of people who do not understand that and want it repaired. And we're going to do that in ES6. We're going to add classes to the language, which is bad. Um, JavaScript's most interesting thing was that it did the prototypal inheritance, which turns out to be easier so, and better. So why is that? So during the go-to argument, um, someone came up with the come from <laughs> statement propose a statement so that it could be eliminated. It turns out we have a come from statement. It's called extends. That inheritance um, is this, is, turns out is overrated and is beneficial as a code reuse pattern, but it comes at a cost and generally we ignore the cost. Um, we tend to write software in layers. So you've got the low level stuff in the middle and, and keep stacking the layers. And if you make an architectural error in one of the lower level errors or levels, you're stuck. You can't fix it because you have dependencies in the higher levels. And then you have to do terrible things in the higher levels because you did things wrong there. And that propagates. So as you add more layers, it just keeps getting worse and worse. And what extends does is give us a whole nother dimension of dependency where if you make a mistake in a, in a fundamental thing, that mistake propagates through a, a larger hierarchy. So it actually makes programs and systems more brittle, which is not what it was intended to do, but that's one of the consequences. So the reason why working with classes is difficult is because you have to do classification. You have to look at all of the classes or all of the objects that you're gonna have in your system and put them into classes. Then you have to do the taxonomy. You have to look at how are all these classes related so that they can inherit from each other in, in the right way. Um, and that is hard to do correctly. It's not that hard to do, but it's hard to do correctly. And usually we do it at the beginning of a project at the time when we least understand how all those objects are gonna work. And we invariably get it wrong because we're doing it at the wrong time when we don't know and, and that's when we do it. Or worse, we don't do it at all and we kind of do it incrementally as we go and that that can be even worse. It turns out in the prototypal system, 
you don't do any of that. You just make objects and you give them the properties that you want and you're done. And all that other stuff you don't have to think about. And the class guys don't understand that. They say, you got to, and you need the tooling. And I totally get the thing about the tooling. And that's why um, static type checking makes so much sense in that environment. Because without it, it's impossibly hard. And so I see people trying to take that model into JavaScript without the strong typing. And it is impossibly hard. Um, you have no tools to, to protect you and to help you doing the refactoring that you have to do because you, you got the taxonomy wrong. It's really hard. Um, it turned out you didn't have to do any of that, but you can't tell anybody. Um, so it turns out, and I'm, I was surprised to, to learn this recently, that prototypal inheritance was actually not a good idea either. Um, it may have made sense in 1995 when JavaScript first came out. It made sense because of memory conservation, that um, you know, if you have lots of objects, they can all inherit from the same object, and therefore you don't have to replicate all the methods. Um, but that's not true anymore. You know, we, we now have gigabyte memories, so that memory conservation is no longer valuable. Um, on the negative side, um, there's confusion about what an object actually is. Is the object its own properties, or is it the own properties plus the inherited properties? Sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it matters a lot. And being unclear as to what the actual composition of the thing is um, does cause problems, does cause bugs. Um, there's also retroactive heredity, where you can add a property to an ancestor after the inheritors have been created and they retroactively inherit that stuff. Um, that causes not a lot of problems in our applications, but it causes huge performance problems for the people building JavaScript engines. Because they're trying to anticipate how the objects are working and how they're constructed. But any time they lose control, and control happens any time you call a function and stuff goes off, when you come back, it's possible that all the objects you're currently looking at have changed what they inherit from. And so that makes a large class of optimizations impossible to do. And so that creates a performance bottleneck on, on where the language can go. So it turns out the brilliant idea in JavaScript wasn't prototypal inheritance. It was class-free object-oriented programming. It turns out that is the brilliant idea. And uh, there are still lots of ways that you can implement the class-free idea in JavaScript. This is the way I do it. Um, I've got a function which will take some value to initialize it. I recommend that be an object. That way you can have a JSON text um, that you use to um, create new instances. Um, you can call another constructor if you want to inherit its stuff. In any case, you're going to create um, an object and put it into a variable called that. You will create all of your uh, member variables, things that are going to become properties of the object, all of your method variables, uh, things that are going to act on the object. Um, those methods will be functions which will close over the initialization value, over all the member variables, and over all the method variables. It could also um, uh, use this and that, but I recommend not. And the reason for not doing that is, if it doesn't use this or that, then you could take any of the functions out of the object and call them independently, and they still do exactly the same thing. So that increases the reliability of the language. It also means you can pass any of those things uh, and use it as a callback without having to bind anything. It just becomes more reliable. Then any uh, methods that need to be uh, public or privileged, you simply attach them to the object and return the object. This is a really flexible pattern. You can get multiple inheritance. You can get aspects. You can get um, factories, lots of things you can do with this basic pattern. JavaScript is an amazingly powerful language. Um, so I'm hoping someday Milner's promise comes true. I think there might be something to the type checking idea. Um, but all of the type checking systems I've seen either don't work. In, in my opinion, any type checking system in which you have to cast or ask what type are you is broken. Um, and the others, the ones that are doing inference, 
are way too complicated and I think way too difficult to use and also still don't uh, keep Milner's promise. I'm hoping someday we figure this out. Um, and if it's not types, then I hope we figure out something else. But we really do need to have the proofs of correctness, but the mathematical idea is not going to work. Um, finally, I want to show you one more example. This is functional programming. Um, functional programming is something we've got in JavaScript now, and we're now finding in virtually every other language. Even Java um, soon is going to have functional programming in it. This one has a completely different uh, trajectory than anything else we've looked at. So let's look at the chronology. So 1958, John McCarthy at MIT starts working on Lisp. Um, he, um, at first Lisp has a thing called prog, which looks a lot like um, an ordinary programming language, just a bunch of statements. It even has a go-to in it. Um, but he also um, saw this thing by Alonzo Church about lambdas. And he didn't really understand what Church was talking about, but it looked like an interesting idea, so they slip it into Lisp. And it turns out to be hugely important. It's where modern functions come from. And it's, um, uh, Milner did uh, ML, which was based on a theoretical language called iSwim. Brilliant stuff in that, but it's not recognized for a long time. Uh, MIT does Scheme, uh, where they uh, rediscover the idea of closure, which is brilliant. Um, it goes through a couple of other iterations, but the mainstream continues to say, no, we don't want it, we don't need it, we don't understand it, we've been working forever without function, functional programming, we don't understand why we need it now. Um, 1999, it gets into JavaScript quickly after, it's in uh, Ruby and, and Python and C Sharp, and, and someday it'll even be in Java. It's now in all the languages, and it's not because anybody asked for it. It's because the language designers got it. They said, oh yeah, this is really good stuff. This is a solution to a lot of problems we actually have that we don't know how to solve in any other way, and it works. And nobody wants it, but we're going to give it to them anyway. <laughs> and it turns out they're right. And we're using it, and it is working, and it's brilliant. Um, so um, again, it's, it took a long time, though. I mean, it's, the work started in 1958. Um, and it's only now that the industry is starting to rec recognize that functional programming is a really big deal. It's very effective for dealing with distributed programming and parallel programming and a lot of the other stuff that we do. And I, I think this community can be very proud that our language was the first, that we showed the rest of the languages how to do this. Um, so um, that brings me to the end. So uh, one more thing about um, paradigm shifts and why it's so hard. And that's because it's really difficult for most of us to distinguish a paradigm shift from a bad idea. They seem to have so much in common that we cannot tell the difference. Um, one way you might be able to tell is if the reason you think it's a bad idea is completely emotional and not based on any kind of reality. That's something to pay attention to. It doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong because you can have the wrong argument and still be right but it's more likely if you have the right argument, you'll be right. So that's it. Um, thank you and good night. Minutes for questions. We have about five minutes for questions. If, if you have a question or a comment, you can come up to the microphones. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question to the um, to the idea of typing type systems. What do you think about using types for documentation purposes? Um, types for documentation seems to be the best reason to use them. Um, but it, the the way that they're specified in most languages is way too much effort for the documentation benefit. Okay. But yeah, that that is a value. So I'm not saying that types have no value. Just saying they don't have enough value. I've been, uh, I've been programming for like two years, um, only JavaScript, uh, and I've been writing some node code, and I use a lot of callbacks, which you have to. Um, I also use async, which is some utility functions for, for dealing with asynchronous stuff. Um, 
so there's been a lot of talk about promises. And to me, it kind of looks like a lot of overhead for some syntax sugar. I'm wondering what you think of promises. Uh, I'm not convinced that promises are the right thing for the specific thing that you're doing, mm -hmm. but I do believe that there is a very important role for promises. There's some very good stuff in there. Right. Um, if you could get everyone here to stop doing one thing in JavaScript, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I could ask everybody to do one thing, please stop making bugs. <laughs> If everybody would simply stop making bugs, and, and it's, it benefits you more than anybody else, right? Because think how much time you'll save. You know, that'll be huge. So yeah, just do that. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.